<coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> and today we want to talk about how to deal with evil people in authority. Amen. There are those people in authority who take advantage of their position. So we want to talk about how to deal with that. And the question was asked, where is the line of obedience when authority is evil? And the answer to that is in Acts chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intended to bring this man's blood upon us. And here's what Peter told him. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Amen. You can be seated. We ought to obey God rather than man, and we know that this is true. Amen? But this is worthy of a deeper answer. And so we examine. We examine the concept of a measured response to authority when authority is wrong. So here is a principle for a lifetime, folks. Submission is absolute, but obedience is is relative. All right? Submission is absolute, but obedience is relative. And folks, that sounds like false doctrine, doesn't it? <laughs> so, submission, see, is a matter of an attitude, whereas obedience is a matter of conduct. So, Peter and John, they were brought before the council, and they were angry at a miracle in Acts chapter 4 verse 13 through 21 says now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus now I love that I think that is an awesome verse you know here they, they, they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men but they marveled and they could tell that they'd been with Jesus and, folks, I think that's what, something we all ought to strive for. No matter where you're at in the education line and all the other kind of stuff, people need to see one thing about you, that you are a Christian. You are a true Christian, and you've been with Jesus. The verse 14 goes on. It says, In beholding the man which was healed, standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded him to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing now how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. Now understand, their spirit, folks, Peter and John, their spirit was not a rebellious spirit. Though their actions seemed to be that way. They acknowledged the authority of the council. And they were very mindful of the authority of the council. You see, but obedience cannot be absolute. <clears throat> Remember your mom and dad when they'd ask you, well, would you jump off a bridge if they asked you to? How many ever heard that as a kid, huh? I heard it. Probably if I heard it once, I heard it a hundred times. Okay. What you're doing is you're teaching balance, okay, to a young person here sometimes when it is difficult. You don't, in other words, just because they told you to do it, it doesn't mean you have to do it. So would you jump off a bridge if they told you to? No, you wouldn't. Right? But if it ain't going to be hurtful or damaging, you would probably do what they told you to do. You're friends. You want to be friends. But when it comes to something harmful, you don't jump off a bridge. And that's what we need to understand here. Peter and John, they were mindful of the authority in the, uh, of the priest and stuff. And, but they 
they could not do something that God wants them to do. So I mean, they could not do what these folks wanted them to. That's not talking the name of Jesus, but God wanted them to sell the name. Amen? Teaching balance. That's what we're trying to do here. See, Mom and Dad, I'm giving you the answer, and you have to listen close here today. In general, authorities are to be obeyed, but some authorities cannot be obeyed, particularly when in reference to Christian principles. If anything comes to you and says, for you not to live the way God has asked you to live, you have to just respectfully ignore that. Amen? When you look at Acts 15, or when, you, when we talked about Acts 15, the apostles then, uh, the elders put it to their, their two cents worth into this conversation. It says, but, when, but then they submitted to James when they said, my sentence is this. All right, so here are some things brought to the council in Jerusalem. James, James was the general superintendent, amen, and so uh, they were asking these things, and he, James says, this is my sentence. Then it, what he said pleased the apostles and the elders and the whole church because the authority in their life spoke. This is the way it's going to be, amen. So it does us well, it does us well to remember a person's authority when you approach someone. Amen? The authority of God is absolute, but our authority is not. Okay? So, when you understand delegation has its limitations, and uh, we have to understand that. When, when the council told them that they could not preach in Jesus' name, they kept their spirits submitted. <clears throat> they did not go off and run off at the mouth of who do you think you are and disrespect that authority. They just, oh, okay, we'll, we'll talk about this later or we're going to do what we need to do. <clears throat> but the council did not have, folks, it did not have the mandate to tell them not to speak the name of Jesus, not to tell people about Jesus. And the disciples were not mouthy. They were not arrogant. When it comes to this situation, they simply went through the process and they kept on preaching. It's kind of a calm resolve. Amen? The disciples did not quarrel. They did not shout and yell and get mad and stomp their feet. It was a quiet descent. So, in Acts 23, 1 through 5, it says, And Paul earnestly beheld the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded that, them that they stood by him, those that stood by him, and smite him on the mouth. Then Paul said to them, God shall smite thee. Paul got a little indignation here, a little upset when they smacked him in the mouth. He said, Thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law. And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? And then listen, Paul gets a little convicted. He says, Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that thou, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Even Paul was convicted by losing his temper with the high priest. I'm sorry. Basically, you're saying, I'm sorry that you're the high priest. I should have thought before he ran his mouth to them. One who has revelation of authority will be soft-hearted and not harsh. When you understand the authority in your life, amen, when things come and when, when the people come against you or whatever, you, and you or the, the authorities come against you, however it may be, you're not going to be uh, harsh and running your mouth, you're going to be soft-hearted and say, and respectful of that authority, respectful of the position, okay? You see, sometimes God's delegated authority will conflict with God's direct authority, okay? We have to understand that, folks, that there are some people that misuse their position, misuse their authority, uh, go against the things of God sometimes. It doesn't make them right, but I believe that God has good intentions when he wants to use somebody. Just like he used King Saul. But King Saul went off the deep end. You see, when he first came to that position, he was a very humble man. And he was, they said he hid among the, 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 
the baggage and all these things. He was hiding. He was a humble man. No, not me, not me. But later on, that authority went to his head. You see, and that's where, that's where in these situations, sometimes God's delegated authority will conflict with God's direct authority. A person can render submission, but you cannot render obedience. Amen? Obedience is related to conduct, so it is relative. But submission is related to the heart. It is absolute. So only God, folks, only God gets absolute unqualified obedience. Anyone lower gets qualified obedience. So if a leader gave an order contrary to God's order, he is to be given submission, but not obedience. Does that understand? understand that? I'll say it again. If a leader gave an order contrary to God's order, he is to be given submission to, but not obedience. If put in a position... If you are put in a position to choose between God or man, we must choose God. Amen? So let's look at some examples of this principle. We read in the Bible about the midwives and Moses. Amen? Moses' mother both disobeyed Pharaoh. But they were also women of faith. In Exodus chapter 1, 16 through 21... And he said, when ye do this, the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them put uh, upon their stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the man child alive. And the king of Egypt called to the mid, for the midwives and said unto them, why have ye done this thing? And, why, and have saved the men's children alive. And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwife come in unto them. Therefore God dealt, with, God, God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mightily. And it came to pass, because the midwives feared God, they feared God, that he made them houses. So here they are, folks. They, the midwives and Moses' mother, disobeyed Pharaoh because God wouldn't allow it. You don't kill. Amen? They obeyed God. They, are, they were women of faith. We're going to do what's right, and God's going to have our back. Think about it. They're going against the king's orders, Pharaoh's orders. But they were more worried about what God would do to them than what Pharaoh would do to them. Amen? And then there's another one in Acts 5, verse 29, and Peter, uh, 29, then Peter said, and, and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. And then we have Daniel. Daniel dis disregarded the command not to pray. In Daniel chapter 6, 9 through 10, wherefore King Darius signed the writing and the decrees. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his window, uh, windows being open in the, his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees there three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as did aforetime. So he disobeyed the king's command. And he went and prayed just like he always did. Rather obey God than the king. Joseph. Joseph took baby Jesus and went to Egypt. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 2, 12 through 14, and being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into G Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the, chi the young child to destroy him. And he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. I like this one here because God warned him in a dream. Herod wanted him to come back. He said, don't go to Herod. You listen to me. Take him to Egypt until I tell you different. So, you know, again, disobeying the king, the, the you know, they were if they were respectful when they were there with the king or, you know, they were in front of the king, they would be respectful. But God said, don't listen to the king. You listen to me. 
The three Hebrew children, the three Hebrew men that would not bow. In Daniel chapter 3, verse 16 through 18, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. I like this. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, even if he doesn't, that's what they're saying. Even if he doesn't, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Sorry, king, we can't listen to you. Direct authority of the king. Do, so we are not going to listen. See, you know, folks, sometimes you just have to take a stand in your faith. Amen? You just have to take a stand. I don't live that way. I don't do those things. Sorry. I, I'm your friend, but I'm not going to do this with you. I love my God too much to disrespect him. Amen? Joseph in Potiphar's house. I will not sin against my God. This lady, his, Potiphar's wife, came to him and was making advancements, wanting to have uh, sexual intercourse with him. And he says, I will not sin against my God. There's just things, folks, we have to take a stand for. And the reason there are so many weak saints is because your Christianity has not cost you anything. Think about it. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 36 through 39, and others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonments. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in the deserts and in the mountains and in the dens and caves of the earth. And these all, Having obedient, having, have, or having obtained a good report through faith, received not their promise. Okay? It's that, that promise is still coming to them. Amen? But they still, they were faithful to God. Now, can you experience, folks, can your experience with God and your love for your God walk you through this kind of stuff? Well, all these different things that we read, can your walk with God and your love for your God get you through hard times? It's sometimes it's just so easy, just a little bit of peer pressure. People give in to peer pressure and, and go against their God. But yet these people went through so much, killed with swords and, 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 uh, uh, scourged, they were, they were beaten, they were in bond, they were in prison, they were stoned, sawn asunder, tempted and slain with swords and wandered about as sheepskins and go, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. But they served God anyways. They were faithful. And sometimes just a little bit of peer pressure. Today, in this day and age, people give in. I pray that your experience and your walk with God will become more than giving in to peer pressure than, than just allowing some of the, the things that are compared to these minute, and we give in. What about, what about if you have an unsaved husband? Would, that, would you give in to that? In 1 Corinthians 7, 12 through 14, but to, but to the rest speak, I... Not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, or she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband and believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by his, the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. You see, if a husband is asking something of a Christian wife, that is not her choosing, should she obey? Obey until the point of sin. Right? Also, children must obey as long as the request is not against God's word. God will 
deliver out of these situations, folks. Amen? If he will deliver you, if you'll take a stand. But you have to take a stand. Amen? The same principle works at school. The same principle works at your job. Stand up for your God. Sorry, boss. I'm going to church. Oh, you get quiet on me here, folks. I live for God. I told one young man one time he was dealing with situations. His boss is wanting him to work and miss church. I said, you tell your boss you wouldn't like me if I wasn't living for God. Huh? Huh? Because I knew him when he was, I mean, you know what he was like when he first came to church. And folks, you want people living for God because then they learn to work, they have a good work ethic. Amen? At least I hope they are. But don't you put your, your job before your God. Amen? Romans chapter 1, verse 16 through 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteous of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. See, God, folks, God is calling us to have courage. He's calling us to have courage. Amen. Ben Franklin said this, if we don't hang together, we most assuredly will hang separately. Amen. See, martyrdom, martyrdom, yeah, martyrdom was the majesty of the early church. Amen. They were martyrs for the Lord. Folks, so we don't want to be weak today. Amen. We don't want to be weak. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, Verse 8 says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immorality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I like this, and I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against this day. Hold fast the forms of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwell in us. This thou knowest that all they which are in Asia, be turned away from me, of whom all Prigulus and Hermogenes, the Lord give mercy unto the house of, oh, these crazy names, of Ornivus. For he oft refreshed me, and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy in the Lord in, the, in that day. And in now how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus. You know us very well. Hebrews 12, 2 and 4. Looking unto the, Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, whom for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down in the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endures such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest he Ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Colossians 3.15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. 
Amen. I like what the Scripture is saying here that Paul was talking about in, in 2 Timothy 1 through 1, 8 through uh, 18. He was saying there, where Tim, I am appointed a preacher to the gospel and teacher for that which cause I suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. Folks, I believe that, but this would not be if you do not know your Savior. You could stand up against these things if you know in whom you believe. Amen? But if you don't really know your God, if you don't really understand how he can, he can keep you and how he can bless you and how great he is for you, you're not going to stand up. And you're going to be dissuaded in, when these times come in your life. You know why the church is told to remain thankful? In, in Romans chapter 1, 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. You see, unless you are thankful for the things that God has done for you, amen, you're not going to, you're not, you're not going to glorify him as your God. You see, we got to look at it as, God, I'm thankful from where you brought me from. I'm thankful I'm not that person that I used to be. Amen. And then you can worship him as your God. So the church must remain thankful. Amen? You know, when you're not thankful for things, you don't tend to take care of them. Amen? So, you know, I, I, when I, I grew up, I was the oldest of eight kids, and we didn't have money. And so when I got nice things, I wanted to take care of them. And I remember I, I'd ride the miracle around on the playground when I was in elementary school. And so many of those kids would drag their shoes, and not me, I put mine up. You know why? I was thankful for a nice pair of shoes, and I didn't want to tear them up. Because they were hard to come by. But see, I know a God that has blessed me and kept me and changed my life and made me something I am today. Hey, Amen. And I'm not what I used to be. So I'm thankful to that God. <laughs> Amen. And what he's done for me, he can still do more for me. And if something comes in my way, hey amen, maybe persecution in my life, I can stand and say, I'm going to serve God anyway. Come on. You see, unthankfulness is the seedbed of deception. Amen. It's the seedbed of deception. Colossians chapter 3, 16 through 17. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Amen. Folks, we, then, then he takes us back. He takes us back to the reality of authority. For a lifetime. In Colossians chapter 3, 18 through 25, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily unto the Lord and not unto men, knowing that the Lord ye shall receive the reward of inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Whatever you do, do it good, because God is watching you. Amen? God sees you. Amen. And God understands. And so God wants you to obey his word and live for him and serve him. Amen. And do what he has asked you to do. So how can we tell if someone, folks, how can we tell if someone is obedient to authority in their lives? See, once a person has had authority revealed, they will look for that authority everywhere in life to see it. Okay. Once authority has been revealed to you, you're going to always look for authority, no matter where you're at, what you're doing. A person who has, not, has met authority will be soft-hearted, not harsh. They're, they'll be afraid of doing wrong. And that's not to make somebody look weak. 
but you're afraid of doing, I don't want to displease my God. I want to be ready for whenever God wants me to come home. So I have to do what is right. I'm going to look for authority because I need authority in my life. If you don't think you need authority in your life, you're fooling yourself. Come on. We all need authority. Truly obedient people are afraid of making an error. So they do not, they, they do not usually go around wanting to be out of authority. There's some people try to avoid authority all through life. They'll bounce from church to church because they don't want to submit to authority. They'll bounce from job to job because they don't want to submit to authority. You know people like that? And they make life very rough for themselves. So they do not walk around with the word from the Lord for anybody. Right? They are quick to counsel. A person, though, under authority learns discretion. They keep their mouth closed and they do not speak carelessly. There's people who do not want to be under authority. They will... Speak anything. And a lot of people just like, oh, okay. You know, they have no respect for that person because they have no respect for authority. And they're just mouthing off. Come on. A person, folks, a person gets sensitive to the rebellion around them. Only a truly submitted person can lead others to submission. Anything else is fake. All right? In the church, there's very little outward disobedience, but it's usually inward disobedience. So, here's my desire for this church. Paul said it best in Ephesians chapter 4, 1 through 15. If therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another, in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, even if ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in ye all. See, he was hillbilly. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, wherefore hath he, hath sa he, he saith, when he ascended upon a high and led captive, captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that ye are ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? That he descended is the same also that ascended up far above the all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Here's why he gave them. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith. And in the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried from, carried about with every wind of doctrine. By the slight of men and the cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head even Christ. Amen. That's what we want for this church. Amen. Folks, we want to be right where God wants us to be. I don't want to walk out from under that umbrella of protection. God has a line of authority, and it's, it's kind of like an umbrella. And when you walk out from underneath that, that's a scary place to be. Amen. And folks, we need to look at what God intended authority to be, and that is a help in our lives and not to destroy us or to harm us. It is good for you. It is good for me to be under authority. I would not want to be 
uh, anywhere in a place of where I didn't have authority in my life. I have authority. I submit to that authority. And I wouldn't ask you to submit to authority if I didn't submit to authority. Amen. But we all need it in our lives. Amen. Amen. So let's stand. <coughs> all right. If you want to take.